Joining me now to discuss race and manhood in today's NFL, our former offensive tackle, Roman Oban, number 72 champion of Super Bowl 37 and veteran of 12 NFL seasons with the Giants, Browns, Buccaneers, and Chargers. Is it really time to think about money for the players? I think in the rare case that it prevents a future, uh, let's say, the combine to go get scrutinized mm -hmm. for any things that you did in college. Let's say when Jenny, Johnny Menzel goes to the combine eventually. Cam Newton in college, I think he stole a laptop and was scrutinized mm -hmm. for that. So in the rare case that it prevents that, that hardship case where a person might want to go outside the traditional means and, and get paid financially. But I think we need to stop having this conversation about life's not fair because these <laughs> big businesses and corporations and benefit and these poor little kids like are getting mm -hmm. exploited. Most kids aren't going to get drafted. Most of them will get the value of a college education mm -hmm. and go on and become productive members of society. So uh, I remember Kevin Ware got injured at Louisville. I'm a Louisville mm -hmm. grad. And yep. everyone starts saying, well, these guys should get paid. So what if he doesn't come back? He still has to graduate with a Louisville degree and still go on and, and with the rest of his life. A lot of people come on and they blame the NCAA, blame the league. The league's not, no, the league is doing a lot. They're, they're, you can't save a, an entire generation, but player engagement, there's programs, players can take classes at Harvard and get certifications, business entrepreneurship programs. So if you come in valuing yourself as a commodity because you're only gonna play three and a half years, that's right. the average, you know what's going to happen at the end, so you're preparing for that. I, I took I took graduate courses during my career so I can prepare for life after football. So I, I'm not blaming the NFL for what happens good or bad after football's over. Commissioner Goodell talked about we did all the research. I was on the benefits committee that did the initial research, and we saw that it would cost I think 1.4 million dollars per player to insure them over the course of a lifetime. So if you're a vested veteran, you know you play three and a half to four years, you get five years of insurance, uh, continuing insurance, and then you have a $25,000 a year that caps at like 300,000, which is 12 years. I played 12 years, mm -hmm. so I was lucky to be the, in that first class of people that would get lifetime benefits. So not lifetime, but up until whatever that mm -hmm. $300,000 caps out. So it, and everyone says, okay, the league should do more, they should do more. And when, with this collective bargaining negotiation, mm -hmm. it really comes down to one side saying what we're willing to accept, and the other side saying what we're willing to give up. And somewhere along the way, they, they meet up in the middle. And it's not a perfect system at all. It's a big travesty to me because, you know, Grambling was the benchmark. And when, when African-American players weren't going to the SEC schools, you had this big host of, of NFL rosters full of uh, HBCU players uh, like Grambling. Mm -hmm. And what Eddie Robson built over all those years, mm -hmm. it, it almost got flushed down the toilet because it seemed like there should have been some type of sustained system in place for fundraising. So they, they could have uh, proper field conditions. I saw the weight room. I saw the video mm -hmm. mold on the shoulder pads. I mean, that's something that, that high school programs don't have. So mm -hmm. you're right. It, it's good to see these players stand up for themselves. And, and to not play a game, I mean, there's a purity about playing the game. All right, it's like yes. it's usually play the game and then we deal with it later. Right, but right. for them not to play the game, it shows you how bad it really got. Uh, and I'm embarrassed. I mean, I know Doug Williams. Well, I'm embarrassed for Doug Williams. I'm embarrassed for that whole program. Mm -hmm. Or any parent that sent their kid to Grambling mm -hmm. to just get an education and have a college football experience. Parents have to, and this is actually an extreme case. I right. mean, these, these, Your kids play football. Yeah, my, but I, in 2001, when my older son was born, I said, all right, no tackle football until 12 years old, until seventh grade, pre-puberty, when right, you're next right. strong enough to take, do soccer, do basketball, do, do all the other sports and build that foundation of your uh, motor skills so that you can take the, the, the abuse of, of football-related injuries. This was before all the, I mean, 2001. Yeah, that so. was just a common sense kind of thing. Yeah, that wasn't you were reading I played, the research and, and, and you read, you and, played the and game. And most guys like me that played aren't yelling and screaming dads. They're not, they're you know, right. like Tony Dungy, they're folding their arms, they're encouraging because right. they know how hard it is. But parents have to understand, like, why do you put your kids in, in football or any sport? Teamwork, setting goals, learning how to deal with adversity. Right. Not for an end result, because right. your eight-year-old kid probably won't make it past high school That's anyway. Right. That's right. Where do you stand, and have you seen any change in where you stand? Well, I had to read uh, about the facts. I had to read and understand what the name really meant. And and this, this there's this word, you know, brand equity. And I think Daniel mm. Snyder has really stood on, on the line of, of brand equity and protecting the brand. And, and for someone who was a pioneer when FedEx Field was built, and the gourmet restaurants, I mean, that was unprecedented. He was a pioneer in that regard, but in this regard, he's, he's exercising his right as an NFL owner that he won't make this decision based on popular opinion, that it's his decision. Uh, Roger Goodell ha hasn't gotten involved, but mm -hmm. I mean, you're seeing President Obama. I mean, mm -hmm. you've brought this to the White House, and, and that's really commendable, but I think all of us have to really take a look and see what this really means. I, I think the name should be changed. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're looking at Daniel Snyder, again, a guy who's an owner who wants to make money, he probably would make more money if he just changed it and did a 
complete yeah. marketing, brand expansion, but I, I don't know why at this point. I think something's got to be done in the next year. Roman, how did you respond to this news? Well, uh, I'm still disappointed at the culture that allowed this to happen, mm -hmm. uh, but I think in Rich Incognito had to, he had to fight it, he had to defend it, and he, he was trying to protect his salary. Uh, but once the investigation is done, uh, I, I think you'll see the, a big culture change in what's allowable, what's permissible uh, in a locker room forever. Uh, it became about the N-word, it became about the use of, of you know, bullying and hazing all, all together. But I think once the investigation is, mm. is said and done, you're going to see a big change in, in an NFL locker room. Now that the, the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, of what goes on in a locker room, in training camp, how rookies and how veterans treat each other.